I'm embarking on a new railway adventure that will take me across the heart of Europe. I'll be using this, my Bradshaw's Continental Railway Guide, dated 1913, which opened up an exotic world of foreign travel for the British tourist. It told travellers where to go, what to see, and how to navigate the thousands of miles of tracks crisscrossing the continent. Now, a century later, I'm using my copy to reveal an era of great optimism and energy, where technology, industry, science and the arts were flourishing. I want to rediscover that lost Europe that in 1913 couldn't know that its way of life would shortly be swept aside by the advent of war. I'm travelling through Germany, powerhouse of today's European Union. A hundred years ago, it already looked muscular, industrially and politically. If I'd been travelling on these tracks in 1913, I'd be visiting quite a new country. The Kingdom of Prussia had merged with or absorbed various principalities and duchies to form the thoroughly modern industrial state of Germany. British travellers here a century ago viewed its power and success with a mixture of admiration, envy and fear. On this journey, I'll discover how Kaiser Wilhelm II's militarism threatened Europe's fragile balance of power. The Navy built two battleships a year, so this was really a, a, a tremendous fleet. I'll let Bradshaw steer me towards Germany's music and culture. Von meinem bösen Geist. Attempt a 1913 equivalent of a Jane Fonda workout. And up! Oh. And down! Go on! Oh. See model railway making on the grandest of scales. This is an absolute paradise for model lovers, for anybody who loves trains. And sample Germany's favourite tipple. What does your expert palate tell you? It's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? My journey starts in Dresden, close to the border with the Czech Republic, then heads north on Germany's oldest long-distance railway through the eastern states to the musical city of Leipzig. Continuing north into Lower Saxony, I'll travel to Braunschweig before arriving at the prosperous port of Hamburg. My journey will end at the home of Germany's Imperial Navy. years before the First World War, the British King had the title Duke of Saxony. My first stop is its capital, Dresden. My Bradshaw says it's always been one of the most frequented cities in Germany. There are English and American quarters. As a city for art, music and good society, Dresden cannot be excelled. If only I'd known it in those days. Fortunately, thanks to the railways, in 1913, thousands of British tourists could enjoy this jewel of a city when it sparkled at its brightest. Dresden on the River Elbe is the birthplace of kings, queens and consorts. The mother of the British Queen Victoria was German, and in 1840, Victoria married her German first cousin. Prince Albert of Saxe Coburg and Gotha, strengthening further the dynastic bond between Britain and Germany. As though to demonstrate German engineering prowess, at the end of the 19th century, Dresden was given a superb station on two levels, one for the terminus and one for the through trains. It was, of course, destroyed by bombs in World War II, and then for the 45 years that East Germany was a Soviet satellite state, the station was neglected. But it was restored at the beginning of the 21st century. And the British architects, Foster and partners, designed a roof which is Teflon coated and covers 30,000 square meters. 
Dresden is now home to more than half a million people. At the time of my Bradshaws, the city was as important a cultural destination as Prague, Paris or Berlin. Dresden's golden age had been the 18th century, when its beauty was captured in a painting by Canaletto, and it became known as Florence on the Elbe. Architecture aside, Dresden is a place of great cultural interest for me. A favorite opera composer, Richard Wagner, spent nearly 20 years here. When my Bradshaw's Guide was published in 1913, the world was celebrating the centenary of Richard Wagner, so he was born just over 200 years ago in nearby Leipzig. Now, many people don't like Wagner. They find him long and loud, and certainly he's politically controversial. But I am a fan. I think for his understanding of humanity, he's one of the greatest artists in history. I think his most absorbing work is his ring cycle of four epic operas, which took him 26 years to write, and which I find extraordinarily deep. But Dresden is associated with one of his very early pieces. In 1842, Dresden's Semper Opera House invited Wagner to premiere his grand tragic tale about two rival Roman families called Rienzi. I'm meeting Cosimo Court to find out how it was received. It was a success then, Vienna, was it? It was a great success. Uh, nevertheless, he didn't like it very much. He said it was like crying around, but uh, uh, it made him popular. But uh, Rienzi is more or less very similar to the Grand Opera, like they had it at that time. Wagner then stayed in Dresden after that? Yeah. First of all, he uh, liked the town because it was the first town where he had such a lot of success and he wanted to present his second opera here only a few months later and this was The Flying Dutchman. Wagner was also a fine conductor, likened by his contemporaries to a general in battle. He was the first who conducted directly face to the musicians. He, of course, he liked to use the baton of the conductor as well. And uh, there's a nice story about it. Sometimes he forgot it. And uh, so he took a ladle that was given by his musician to him and he broke the handle and conducted with that. But you know, even nowadays you have fantastic conductors. They use two sticks or whatever to conduct. They can do it with every mean. But nobody's done it with a ladle. <laughs> never again, never again. In Dresden, Wagner briefly helped to orchestrate a military operation. In a period of revolutions across the continent, people in Dresden took to the streets. Wagner became very actively involved in politics, didn't he, in 1849. What was it that happened? In the 19th century, Dresden was a really international town, open to many other countries, and uh, this was a time when the living conditions for the workers weren't in the highest condition, and that's why um, Marx uh, published his uh, Caesars of a New World, and uh, this caused a lot of trouble and uh, started a movement of a revolution, which started in Dresden in 1849. And Wagner was drawn into that, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a great enthusiast about these uh, changes of living conditions. He himself was especially interested in the changing of uh, the way how musicians are paid, that uh, maybe the opera should not be owned by the king, it should be owned by the masses. The authorities sought help from Prussia, which used a new invention, railways, to send troops. What job was given to Wagner in this revolution? He had a fantastic job. He had to climb up to the tower of one of our churches and to watch where the army is coming from and to announce it to somebody else. And uh, because it was such a hard job, he asked uh, to send a bottle of wine to him. Oh, and that would help with his work. Over 200 rebels were killed in the fighting. And although Wagner escaped, a warrant was issued for his arrest. And so that was bye-bye Dresden for Richard Wagner? Yeah. 
not forever. He came later on back to Dresden because his wife, she stayed in Dresden, Mina Planer, and uh, she herself tried to, to make him apologize and to be accepted again as a normal member of the society. And she could do so, and she succeeded in doing it. And it's not just in the opera house that Wagner gets an airing. Hello, excuse me. That was uh, that was charming. What's the song about? Actually, it's a warning of not having sex before marriage. Comes a little bit late for me, but thank you anyway. Bye. Yeah. The now beautifully restored Lutheran Church of Our Lady, the Frauenkirche, is symbolic of what the Germans have experienced since British tourists first followed my guide here. Destroyed by Allied bombing in 1945, for decades its ruins constituted an anti-war memorial. When East and West Germany were reunified in 1990, the church was painstakingly reconstructed. The Frauenkirche manages to be both pretty and overpowering, which is perhaps why the people of Dresden love it so much. In 1843, it was the scene of an extraordinary choral work with an orchestra of 100 and a choir of 1,100. The conductor was one Richard Wagner, the composer was one Richard Wagner, and the subject was the Last Supper of Christ. Today, the Frauenkirche symbolizes the rebirth of Dresden, following the destruction of its buildings and population. Early travellers to Dresden, I'm sure, would have remarked on the romantic look and feel of the place. In 1913, the city was in the grip of a health craze. A new philosophy of well-being called Naturheilkunde, or naturopathy, had taken hold. And its mantra was, in einem gesunden Körper wohnt ein gesunder Geist, or as we would say, a healthy mind in a healthy body. Like the rest of Europe, Dresden had experienced industrialization, bringing with it smoky factory chimneys and polluted atmosphere and water. But the fresh air of the hills around the city became a magnet for international health tourists. I'm headed for Weisse Hirsch. Bradshaw's tells me it's a well-known health resort that's grown from a village in recent years and now has villas, hotels and sanatoriums of the highest repute reached by electric car from Dresden. I wondered what an electric car might be. It turns out to be a thoroughly original suspended railway. It's one of the oldest suspension railways in the world. It climbs 84 meters and is 274 meters long. In 1913, it also provided an easy escape for Europe's wealthy and leisured elite, intent on improving their physical health and fitness. Prussian nobility and Russian royalty rub shoulders with well-heeled merchants and military top brass, actors, singers and writers. Eckhart. Hi, Michael. I'm meeting author Eckhart Barr at the once grand and famous spa resort Der Weisse Hirsch now decidedly faded and overgrown. I, I get the impression that at the beginning of the 20th century there was a new interest in health. That's true. And coming up to the top of a hill like this, people wanted to get away from the industrial cities? That's right. There was a sense of back to nature and uh, Dr. Lahmann, who was a physician of that time, he combined this new feeling, this new style of, of thinking with uh, a great new idea. So he combined health care and treatments with a new sense of uh, fresh air, of a good portion of diet, 
and also uh, a good sense of humor. Dr. Heinrich Lahmann, a pioneer of food and health treatments, was a man ahead of his time, recommending diet and exercise instead of prescription drugs. The buildings were clearly very impressive. That's true. And Natura Sanat, Latin for what? Uh, nature cures all, is that it? Yes, nature cures, like water cures, and also fresh air, baths in the sunshine. This, I take it, is the uh, bathhouse. That's true, yes, the bathhouse. There was a female bath for the ladies and uh, a bath for the gentlemen. What sort of treatments did Dr. Larman propose? In the bathhouse, they got uh, showers, extremely pointed to different parts of the body. Mm. And yes, and then again, different kinds of light, warm and cold. So it was a strange combination sometimes. For instance, they were sitting in a box and uh, this was full with electric lights. And so they got even small electric shocks. And then he sent them out to the forest and nearly naked, they were a very small piece of clothes and they stood, stood still in the in the surrounding and listen to the, to the voices of the birds. <laughs> I'm sure that'd be very good for you. By 1913, more than 7,000 guests had visited Der Weisse Hirsch. And many of them were already wedded to the latest physical exercise regime. The Mr. Motivator of his day was famous Danish athlete J.P. Muller. His best-selling fitness book, My System, was designed to turn parlor dandies into men of iron in just six weeks. Fitness instructor Grit Buchner is going to put me through my paces. This person here is not wearing many clothes. What, what was the appropriate clothing for the Muller? Um, Muller said you, you need not a lot of clothes. You go outside and if it's cold or it's hot, that's enough. Uh, it makes you harder if you don't have so lot clothes. Mm -hmm. And so, can you show me the system? Yeah, I can show you. But please, not in this clothes, do sports clothes or, or less clothes. I'll go and get yeah. less clothes, <laughs> yeah. Keep young and beautiful. It's your duty to be beautiful. Keep young and beautiful if you wanna be loved. Muller's magical formula consists of 18 different exercises practiced daily during a 15 minute workout. Right. Right. I think I'm ready. Okay, stand short and chop. Short and chop. Short and chop. 13 times. What? Yeah. <laughs> stretch, your, stretch your knee. Okay. What's with I've... your leg? No. Uh. Look at Tisha. She do it right. Hello, Tisha. The more you do over the six weeks, the stronger and fitter you should become. The last three, do as high as you can. One. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Are you warm? Yeah, warm down. And you feel it in your legs? Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. We do the next. Wow. Well, if I get a figure like that, it will be worth it. <laughs> do this? What? Yeah. What's with your legs? I can't reach my toes, all right. You must stretch. <sighs> Have so. we done our 15 minutes yet? With sales of over 2 million, my system was endorsed by doctors and kings. The Czech writer Franz Kafka swore by it. And fitness regimes today owe much to Muller's once radical ideas. Right leg, left leg. <laughs> this is quite tiring. Down the armor. And up. Oh. And down, go on. No. <laughs> no more. Yeah. Oh. Good job. Kafka <laughs> wrote really extraordinary stories. He gave a word yeah. for the English language for things that were really bizarre. They're called Kafka S. If you're ever asked if you saw something Kafka esque, say yes. Michael Portillo doing gymnastics. Keep <laughs> young and beautiful if you want to be loved. On this new day, I'll be embarking on a highly historic railway line which first opened in 1839.
My next stop will be Leipzig. Uh, Bradshaws tells me it's a town of great commercial importance. It's the seat of the supreme law courts of the German Empire, and its university is ancient and renowned. And I'm traveling on tracks that are pretty significant too, because this was the first major long distance railway made in Germany, and it's almost as British as my Bradshaws. In the 19th century, the main industry in Saxony was textiles, linen and woolen cloth. Economist Friedrich List, seeing the great possibilities that the railways had offered British industry, conceived in the 1830s a railway unifying the states of Germany. And who better to build it than British engineers? Rail historian John Lace is an expert on the line. Hello, John. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Good to see you. So this railway line from Dresden to Leipzig uh, plays a very important part in German railway history. How did the railway actually come to be built? The Leipzig directors approached James Walker, who then was the president of the Institute of Civil Engineers in London, and he came across with his young assistant, who, James Hawkshaw, who was 23, to survey the line between. Walker took two weeks, at the end of it said, I've done all I need to do, there's more work for me back in uh, Britain, and left Hawkshaw to walk the route endlessly. Without modern surveying equipment and no GPS, engineers like Hawkshaw faced a huge challenge to get 116 kilometers of route just right. I'd like to show you this map actually, which gives a, a really good overview of the entire line and shows what John Hawkshaw had created. Uh, it's a very detailed map and it shows every bridge, every crossing and all the cuttings that there were and the one tunnel that was built uh, at Oberau. It's a relatively simple line then, it doesn't have a lot of ups and downs. No, um, James Walker had been one of the developers of the Leeds Selby line, which is a very flat line, and so when he proposed this line, the directors were overjoyed. To complement the British construction know-how, the Leipzig Dresden Railway Company ordered 16 British locomotives. Its first coal-fueled steam engine was called Comet. John Robson, uh, who was a driver with the Liverpool Manchester Railway Line, accompanied the first Comet from Bolton to Liverpool docks and on to Hamburg and then down the Elbe, 15 crates. Robson was skillful enough to reassemble those 15 crates into a working locomotive. That is an extraordinary thought. How, how fast was Comet in those early days? Oh, between four and six miles per hour. I didn't uh, travel the speed that this train is travelling now at. With Friedrich List's ambition fast becoming a reality, the people of Saxony flocked to experience train travel. There were up to six trains per day passing up and down on the Leipzig to Dresden line. Commercially, it was also a success, finally giving businesses a quick way to move goods to the River Elbe. Leipzig is a city made of music. It was home to Johann Sebastian Bach and Felix Mendelssohn, and is famous for its opera house and the St. Thomas's Boys Choir. But as well as being a centre of culture, thanks to the railway, it's also one of Germany's leading commercial cities. The railway station in Leipzig, according to Bradshaws, is the largest in Europe. And it's still thought to be the biggest in our continent by floor area, with its 24 platforms and six railway sheds. And now since the fall of communism, vast parts of the station have been converted to a shopping complex. In 1913, Leipzig was at the heart of one of the most productive areas in Europe. Germany's late industrial revolution meant that entrepreneurs could take full advantage of new technology and manufacturing methods. To appreciate how productive and self-confident Germany had become, I'm heading by a tram to the west of the city to the suburb of Plugwitz. It's home to what was one of the largest cotton spinning mills in Europe. I've arranged to meet Bertram Schulze, who runs the Spinnerei today. Hello, Bertrand. Hello, very welcome. 
We're walking along tracks. Were the railways very important for the development of this place? Actually, it was essential. They, they bought this property of about 100,000 square meters because the developer over 100 years ago, whose name was Dr. Karl Heine, had arranged that the tracks were brought into the big properties so that the goods could come in, the raw material, and that the goods could go out again. Well, they founded the place in 1884 based on this market research so that it would be profitable to create a big inner German cotton spinning mill producing mainly the thicker threads. It meant that the mill could spin the cotton itself rather than rely on foreign imports. So a visitor coming here in 1913 using this uh, guidebook would have found the factory in full production? Yeah, full scale, very lively, I guess, um, working in a three-shift system, so going through all the time. The spinnerized 1,600 workers were processing 20,000 bales of cotton into 5 million kilograms of thread. Bertram wants to show me what's left of just one of the huge spinning rooms where productivity reached unassailable levels. Yeah, this is the old elevator, but we just put in some very new technique into it, so we should feel safe. Whoa, what a vast space. Yeah, this is where we still have the full scale of the 4,000 square meters on one store, on one layer, where you can still have the feeling how it worked with the machinery in here. So they had the machinery actually going in long lines like this between the columns, and uh, you must imagine like, 20 meter machine actually and then people working on it and uh, now it's quite hot with the machinery it must have been much hotter yeah. so they had very early air conditioning and air moisturing system in here which was in the middle where you can see the walls back there while the air conditioning is testament to German engineering prowess the mill also illustrates what Germany regarded as a great weakness the lack of colonies as the imperial powers of Europe scrambled to carve up Africa between them, Germany was late to the table, securing only a few colonies in the south and west, and modern-day Tanzania in the east. This paucity rankled the Kaiser, who wanted new markets for goods and new sources of raw materials. Germany was able to use the territory in Tanzania to grow its own cotton. Germany, yeah, but especially the cotton spinning mill. I think Tanzania, today's Tanzania, was uh, used for different reasons as well. Um, but this company here had their colonies down there, about uh, 30,000 hectares, so that's uh, really quite a big space, which they turned into farmland and tried to grow their own cotton. Cotton growing conditions in Tanzania were hard. Pests put paid to two thirds of the harvest in the second year, and the scheme failed. Today the cotton machines are long gone, and in their place is art. Historically, the most renowned artists of Leipzig were musicians. My guidebook directs me to the Thomas Kirche, or St. Thomas's Church, with its lofty roof. Very distinctive, and its monument to Johann Sebastian Bach. Now Bach was the so-called Thomas Cantor here at the church and more to the point he wrote several cantatas while he was in charge of the boys choir here and he effectively established Leipzig as the musical capital of Saxony, arguably of Europe. I'm heading to a remarkable music school where the creativity of Bach could be sustained and nurtured, and one generation of genius could inspire the next. I'm meeting conservatory librarian Barbara Wehrmann at the Hochschule. My Bradshaws tells me about the famous music conservatorium of Leipzig. Why was it so famous? Oh, actually, it was the first conservatory, music conservatory in Germany, and especially our founder, he's really famous, it's Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi. And it was his idea to have a conservatory, a music school in Leipzig. He was a really good music politician. He really made politics here in, in Leipzig so that it became in his time the music town Leipzig, music city Leipzig. The students of this elite music school were privileged indeed. 
Not only did they study under a great composer, they were also taught by the musicians of his Gewandhaus Orchestra. I brought you to the library to tell you about of some of our famous alumni and to show you some archival materials. You must have had so many, I imagine. Who, who are the most famous? Okay, I think one of the most famous is Edward Grieg. Yeah. And Leos Janacek is one of the famous. And of course, this will be for interest for you, it's Arthur Sullivan. Arthur Sullivan, the composer half of Gilbert and Sullivan, won the Royal Academy of Music's first Mendelssohn scholarship to study here. Barbara wants to show me how the young Arthur fitted in. If we have a look at our reports, there are two reports left. He came here in 1858 and he left in 1861. And the reports say that he was really good in composing. Ferdinand David, he was the first violinist of the Gwantas Orchestra, and you must know the first violinist is also responsible for conducting, and he said he's really talented in conducting. Good heavens. And what's this, what's this here? Oh, these are the program notes of his final exam, and he played here and he conducted himself uh, his own composition, The Tempest by Shakespeare. And do you know how that was received? Was that well received? It was very well received uh, here in Germany and also I think it was well received when he returned to Britain. I should think it was hard for the people in the conservatory to imagine that Arthur Sullivan, such a gifted conductor and composer, would one day become famous for satirical operettas. Okay. <laughs> okay, it was, it was surprising, let's say. Just like Sullivan, the current crop of talented students benefit from Mendelssohn's legacy. You're studying here at the conservatory. Do you have a great sense of history about the place? Yeah, there is a sense of history. I can feel the history when I go through the city and see the houses. Bach is a great inspiration. Yes, every time I'm looking for a good program for my semester, Bach has to be in it. Uh, maybe a little more Bach then? Yes. In a city of so many students, the 1913 traveller might not have been surprised to find a jolly good pub. In this most famous subterranean Leipzig haunt, Auerbach's Keller, they could enjoy a hell of a good evening. Thank you very much. This is a typical Saxony food, a beef roulade, with dumpling potatoes and red cabbage. Wow, that does sound typically yes. Saxon. The dumpling potatoes are very solid. They're chewy, but they really absorb the gravy. The beef is uh, stuffed with olives and other vegetables. A very good meal. Oh, glücklich, wer noch hoffen kann. Aus diesem Meer des Irrtums aufzutauchen. Aufzutauchen. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the Shakespeare of Germany, set a key scene of his tragedy Faust here. Von meinem bösen Geist. Faust sells his soul to the devil in return for knowledge and worldly pleasures. Together they visit the Keller where Goethe used to drink as a student. Und ringsherum liegt grüne Weide. Well, I assume that those were lines from Goethe's Faust, but I must say this devil wouldn't tempt me to very much. After devil and dumplings, I'm ready for heavenly sleep.
climb up early, heading north from Leipzig station into Lower Saxony. I'm approaching the halfway point of my journey through Germany from Dresden in the east to Kiel in the north. You can get a nice cooked breakfast on the German railways, but on this train it's strictly self-service. My destination today is Braunschweig or Brunswick. Uh, I'm changing at Magdeburg. I was supposed to have six minutes to make the change, but this train is arriving late, so it's going to be a real chase. Uh, Köln, bitte. Links, links, danke. The train for Köln or Cologne stops at Brunswick, but it's three platforms away. Braunschweig. Ah. Hmm. Made it. Relief. Now that I'm on the Brunswick train, my journey should take me just 45 minutes. Helmstedt is an interesting station because in the old days this was the border between East Germany and West Germany. Now, of course, there is no border and the trains go through smoothly. And to the uninitiated like me, you can't see the difference between East and West Germany. It is now an entirely seamless country. Brunswick was the birthplace of Caroline of Brunswick, who became known as the Injured Queen of England. In 1795, Britain's future King George IV agreed to marry her, although she was described as short, fat and ugly, because Parliament agreed to pay off his gambling debts if he did. Caroline duly bore him an heir, and George then duly left her. So it seems rather surprising that Bradshaw specifically notes that Brunswick residents are happy. My book says that the people from Braunschweig are cheerful, happy. I, I, I heard it. Is uh, it true? Uh, I would uh, say uh, half and half. Some people are very cheerful and I, some people are... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sie sind uh, fröhlich, yeah? Ja, yeah, warum nicht? Yeah. Why not be happy? Why not be happy? Yeah. yeah. Brown check is, yeah, it's... They're, they're smiling. You have a lovely sure. smile. Yeah. Oh, oh, let's thank see that smile. You. That is thank a lovely you. smile. <laughs> <laughs> that would make everybody happy. Yeah. 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 Ye
and there's a lot of training you have to undergo to um, develop a palate for beer. Tasting is still our most important quality check. So we sample every batch every day. Were you born with a fine palate? I do have a bit of a palate, yes. And how did you discover that? <laughs> Don't want to answer that question. <laughs> I carry a guidebook from 1913, and I'm wondering, what would beer have tasted like at the beginning of the 20th century, do you think? Would have tasted more bitter than it tastes now, and also a bit sweeter. That means more body. Um, I can give you a sample of a beer that comes pretty close to what beer would have tasted like 100 years ago. It doesn't taste very bitter to me. It does taste a bit sweet. But actually, it tastes pretty good. What does your expert palate tell you? It's perfect, isn't it? <laughs> it's pretty good, isn't it? Volters produces around 270 million bottles and cans of beer a year, all now transported by road. But with nearly 200 kilometers between me and my hotel, I'm definitely letting the train take the strain. Anna, I have to change trains here. My next stop will be Hamburg. According to my Bradshaws, it's situated on the river Elbe, 60 miles from the mouth of the river the second city of the German Empire. It ranks in commercial importance before any other town in continental Europe. By 1913, the great British ports of Liverpool and London had to regard Hamburg as a serious rival. Its huge port that gives Hamburg this access to the world is situated in the heart of the city. And as Germany's second largest city, it's also one of Europe's most affluent. Hamburg's main station is really awe-inspiring. It was built in 1906, apparently replacing four different terminal stations. So for the traveller with the Bradshaw's Guide in 1913, it would have been new it is, they say, the busiest station in Germany, the second busiest in all of Europe after Paris's Gare du Nord, and this evening, it really feels like it. Time, I think, to find the quiet sanctuary of my hotel. When I think of Hamburg, I picture a busy industrial port. Its beauty is an unexpected bonus. The Bradshaw's Guide loves to list major engineering feats. Under the Elbe is a double tunnel for pedestrians and vehicles 490 yards long, made at a cost of over £500,000. With that tone of enthusiasm, this has to be worth seeing. By the early 1900s, Hamburg's traffic problems were chronic. The roads were hectic, and the river even worse. Congestion and currents made life difficult for workers crossing from the city to Hamburg's bustling docks. The solution was to dig the St. Pauli Elbe Tunnel, and this grand entrance hall is the way in. Well, this is built on an extraordinary scale, but it's not just the size of it, it is the architectural grandeur. It's been built like the, uh, the Pantheon in Rome, and it's beautifully tiled. And here I see reliefs I imagine these are the engineers and the architects immortalized in statues, and quite rightly so.
Four huge lifts on either side of the river carry pedestrians, cyclists and motor vehicles to the bottom. Where they enter two narrow tunnels taking traffic backwards and forwards. Hello, Hartman. Hello, Michael. Welcome to the old Elbow Tunnel. Oh, thank you very much. I, I'm finding it impressive and beautiful. Yes, it is. Hartbutt Grafe is the head engineer responsible for keeping the tunnel running. Uh, when was it actually built? It was built up to 1911 and uh, it was uh, planned up to 1905 uh, and the planning was heavily influenced by the Glasgow Tunnel. The decision to build a tunnel rather than a bridge? Um, the port was too active for a bridge and uh, the, the ships were too big. Just step out of the way here. It's built quite narrow. Uh, was there a lot of traffic in the early days? Yeah, there was uh, quite a lot of traffic, uh, uh, mostly uh, by horses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I suppose the early motor cars. Yeah, the early motor cars. There are some pictures with very old cars, yeah. Why do you think it was built so grandly in the style of the Pantheon and with such beautiful tiles? At, at this time, uh, 1900, uh, Germany had, uh, still had an emperor mm. and uh, he, wants to be, he wanted to be proud about this and so perhaps this was a bit the reason, perhaps uh, because it was built in this way. I mean, everywhere we look there are beautiful yeah. ornaments, yeah. decorations. And also um, <clears throat> Hamburg wanted to show what it's able to build. It's a pretty active tunnel, isn't it? But at just over 100 years old, the tunnel is showing signs of age. Ready. And major restoration work is being carried out on the second bore. This is amazing because you've obviously taken the tunnel back to its original skin. What, what is the job you're doing now? Um, the main job we are doing here at the moment is to renew the lab. How long will this job take you? It takes us uh, already nearly two years and it will take us uh, up to 2016. Oh. So why is Hamburg spending the money on these tunnels, do you think? Um, because this is uh, a thing what is very important for all Hamburg people and uh, they don't want to miss it. Well, thanks to you, they're not going to miss it. This might seem like a DIY job, but this is to protect future generations from lead poisoning. I'm delighted that this engineering heritage is being celebrated and restored. My next stop isn't old at all. But if Bradshaws were to be republished today, this place would secure an enthusiastic mention. Hamburg is home to the greatest model railway in the world. Miniature Wunderland has 13,000 metres of track, covering an area of 1,300 square metres, divided up into eight huge sections representing different countries. I'm meeting one of the model's founders, Sebastian Drechsler. Sebastian, this is an absolute paradise for model lovers, for children, for adults, for anybody who loves trains. It's fantastic. Uh, how long has it been here? It's here for 12 years. My two older brothers had the idea when I was 18. Back in the day, they had a club and a record label and decided they don't want to get old a nightclub and came home with a strange idea. And one was to build the largest model railway of the world. And it was very hard for me to imagine to change the guest list of a club to the guest list of a model railway. But I'm astonished, you've only been doing this for 12 years. Exactly. In this 12 or 13 years, we spent about 560,000 working hours just in the layout to create all of that. And you have now established the largest model railway in the world? Already. Since we opened up Switzerland, we are the world's largest model railway. Now, um, where is the United Kingdom? I thought I might go there. It's only in our head. Uh, no we United will... Kingdom? Not now, because we need the perfect space. It's the motherland of um, railways, and we need to have 
such a huge um, space where we want to build a uh, spectacular United Kingdom. This is our control room, the core of everything in miniature wonderland. But well, it is so impressive. I mean, of course, it looks like the control room of a real railway. It's just astonishing. We have 265 cameras on the whole layout because there are train accidents all over the layout. And before someone is running and searching for the train where exactly it is, uh, we first localize the train with the cameras and then go to fix the problem. <laughs> and so the guy is working here. I mean, I imagine if one day they were asked to go and work for the German railways, they, <laughs> they could do the transition. I'm pretty sure they could. Yeah. Yeah. The wonder of this miniature world is its attention to tiny detail. Every one of the 250,000 inhabitants has a story. And model maker Sonja Schroeder is going to show me how they come to life. Well, I hope you have your spectacles. <laughs> I do. So first you should dip your um, brush into the water, just slightly. And you definitely should start with a pink shirt. If you haven't worked it out yet, Sonia is coaching me to paint a mini-me. And try to paint around your hand and the booklet. You're doing well. Just do little, little paint strips. Now I begin to understand the high standards that they set themselves. My Bradshaw is about 2% of the size of me. And so this is quite a small target. Hmm? Not bad. You know what, Michael, I can tell. You did neither party last night nor drink coffee this morning. <laughs> is that right? <laughs> Does my Bradshaw look big in this? Eagle-eyed tourists in Wonderland can now spot a brightly coloured fellow clutching a red book. He's marooned in perpetuity in the middle of Hamburg station. There are uglier places to spend eternity. Although I could quite happily linger with my alter ego, the tracks are calling and the scent of the Baltic Sea. At the time of my Bradshaws, Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany sought colonial and naval power. Locked in a naval race with Britain, he'd already built a fleet of 39 warships based at Kiel. As tensions grew, the Kaiser's navy needed a quick and safe route from the Baltic to face the British in the North Sea. To sail north round Denmark's Jutland Peninsula was dangerous and a diversion of 250 nautical miles. But the Kiel Canal was too narrow for warships. So the Kaiser undertook a massive widening all along the canal's 100 kilometers. And today that feat of German engineering is still in use. With close to 35,000 ships a year passing through. Now to test my sea legs. Ahoy, skipper! Thank you. Happy to receive boarders? Yes, please. What a wonderful vessel. Yes, a racing yacht from the, from the last turn of last century. It's absolutely beautiful. Thank yeah. you so much for having me yeah. on board. With Andreas Neubauer, president of the Kiel Sailing Association, I can experience why the Kaiser was captivated by yachting. So Andreas, we've left the British Kiel Yacht Club behind us. Where are we now? We are in a, right in the middle of the Kiel Fjord. And of course, it's one of the, the most important sailing areas in the whole world. So this is very much the equivalent of cows. You have a, a is, Kiel yeah. week as we have a cows week. Yes, and, and the Kaiser had a special interest in, in uh, cows week. And so he really copied it. This international racing attracted some impressive competition. The Kaiser's biggest rival was his uncle, British King Edward VII. But the yachtsmen couldn't have failed to notice the significance of the growing presence of warships. The Navy built two battleships a year. So in the end they had 39 battleships. So this was really a, a, a tremendous fleet. Now declassified documents show that by 1913, British intelligence was already monitoring the growing threat using British yachtsmen to do the surveillance. 
I feel a little bit like um, Carruthers in that novel. You know that uh, novel, The Riddle of the Sands, which yeah. is about uh, a couple of British guys who go spying on the, oh, on the yeah, German they, Navy. There were, there, were, there were many spies. For instance, um, the Sunbeam from, from Lord Bresse came here at one year, and the old l lord let himself row into a, to a, a submarine pen. Of course, they, they didn't make much of it, but yes, this was, of course, a little spy spy tour. The intelligence conveyed the start news that by 1913, Britain faced an ambitious rival with a formidable navy. And as the yachts gathered for Kiel Week a year later, Europe was slipping towards war. The spark was the assassination by a Serb in Sarajevo of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the Kaiser heard the news aboard his yacht. Over the fjord came the little boat of uh, Admiral von Müller and said, I have an, ur an ur urgent uh, message here. He put it in, uh, put this thing in, into his cigarette box and threw it on board. And there the Kaiser had it. That was the last weekend in June. Uh, uh, and by uh, the beginning of August, Europe was at war. Events in the Balkans set off a chain reaction. Germany encouraged its Austro-Hungarian ally to strike back against Serbia. The alliance of Russia and France prepared for war as armies mobilized across Europe. Germany marched through Belgium to strike at France and Britain was obliged to act in her defense. British Foreign Secretary Lord Grey lamented, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Over the next four years, Europe squandered the benefits of peace and progress in a savage mechanized war. During the 19th century, the railways helped to bring together the culture of Dresden, the musicality of Leipzig, the trading power of Hamburg, and the economic might of Berlin. The new Germany was an industrial, scientific and artistic giant, elbowing Britain aside in the European league tables. Sadly, statesmen did not appreciate that the enviable prosperity and civilization of Germany depended on the absence of war. Next time, I lose my inhibitions in a Swedish sauna. On the whole, I don't take my clothes off with people I don't know. <laughs> Ride one of the world's oldest fairground attractions. <laughs> Have a Highland fling Scandinavian style and brave a white knuckle ride based on a winter sport invented by Norwegians. <laughs> one of the great experiences of my life. Two is the keeper of all things quite interesting tonight. Sarah Millican and Bill Bailey join Stephen Fry in a moment. What happens when obsession turns nasty? Judy Dench and Kate Blanchett star in a film later. Notes on a scandal is at 10:30.